From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Here's what's ahead. Offering up this week's cattle market segment out of Iowa State University, Lee Schultz. In addition to commenting on last week's price trends, Lee will take a look at the market share now being held by organic beef and how it's competing price-wise with conventionally produced beef. Also, we'll welcome back in K-State's Jordan Gebhard and Cassie Jones. They'll talk more about their research in the area of livestock feed biosecurity, and this time how their work is providing useful information on feed processing and delivery that can be applied at the farm, ranch, and feedlot levels. And further ahead, Jeff Wickman will check in with this week's 4-H segment. Here on this Agriculture Today. A social distancing tip. While the CDC urges you to avoid close contact, like hugging or shaking hands, there are other non-physical ways to say hello. Wave, wink, use sign language, salute, smile, give the peace sign, throw up an air high five, do jazz hands. Remember, stay a minimum of six feet or two arms length away from others and stay home if you can. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. You're listening to Agriculture Today, and the cattle market segment is first up as we visit with livestock economist Lee Schultz of Iowa State University. Lee, we'll get to some interesting information on organic beef in the marketplace. That's later on. As we look, though, at the current state of affairs in the cattle trades, rather sluggish on the fed cattle side, isn't it? Yeah, I think you could maybe term it as just some chop in the trade. You know, we've seen uh, some weakness early week and then some weakness later in the week. And really, you know, that, that's that been just kind of, I think, a sentiment in, in this market, just kind of trying to find a place in the market. From a cash standpoint, midweek sales were 110 to 112. By late in the week, they were 109 to, to 110. Uh, you know, to compare to, to a year ago, uh, we're roughly eight dollars off year ago prices, and really at a time we were similar a couple months ago, and we just didn't really see the the seasonal strength in this fourth quarter that we had seen a year ago. This really is not atypical for this time of the year, though, is it? No, it isn't, and that's really interesting that that you bring it up because I think there is some signs that we're seeing traditional purchasing patterns, right, and we're seeing some strength in, in that demand. And, and maybe not necessarily seeing it flow through to to cattle prices. Now, you know, this year is is obviously you know just been confusing from a supply and demand standpoint. But I, I think you know what what you're seeing here is is still rather large supplies weighing on the market, be it slaughter numbers and or and, and weights. I mean, is it, really pushing that that beef production. So that that's providing a bit of bit of weight there. Now, I think, you know, expectations are we will improve um, just from a pure seasonal standpoint as you're looking at prices out into 2021. And we'll get to that as well. Just for the record, boxed beef trade last week, how did it fare? I think you're seeing the seasonal break now underway. Uh, we, you know, we've seen from uh, Friday to Friday, it was about $8 lower. If you look at the average from, from the two weeks, we're, we're roughly $3 lower. You know, we we seen some uh, some narrowing of the choice select spread. I um, mean, I think that's an indication that you know we're maybe seeing an uptick in in just uh, overall winter purchases, right? So so some of those roasts and such. Um, so kind of bridging that holiday purchasing and and just normal purchasing. Uh, so I you know I would expect a, a little bit of weakness here in, in this this cutout um, as we go through the, the next couple of weeks at least, and then seeing how, how well we hold it into the new year. But, and we've talked about this with your colleagues that comment in this segment, given everything, it's fairly remarkable yet how how well the cattle markets are holding up. Yeah, it's, you know, it is perspective, right? And, and I think that's, you know, important to, to keep in mind. And, you know, we have to look at from a pricing standpoint, remember a lot of those cattle that, that are coming to market now were, were bought at relatively low prices. So even though prices are lower, you know, it, it isn't as pinching 
as if, you know, those placement prices were much higher. And so, um, you know, I think we're still seeing some red ink in cattle finishing here, but, but maybe even close to break even. You know, what a lot of our models don't necessarily estimate is, is really the great conditions we've seen this year from a weather standpoint. So performance has been phenomenal in, in feedlots and a lot of the data that I've seen. So, you know, while cost of gain is creeping up, that performance is, is really helping, certainly. Lee, you just put together a quite interesting article we wanted to cite today on organic beef and its place in the beef market. Again, we've seen organic beef gain a greater toehold in recent years, and and you have some numbers that give us an indication of that. Yeah, and and the article I put together here, and it's posted on our Ag Decision Maker website, You know, I I think it's maybe a part two to earlier in the year, I looked at the local market. And I think part of 2020 is, you know, we've just looked at, you know, a lot of alternative markets, right? And and organic is one. And we've seen some some growth over the last several years. And I think that's just in line with consumers are asking more about where their food comes from. So organic being one of those marketing tools that, that producers can use, but understanding that that there's an additional cost there. So producers, you know, are always weighing that additional cost and then what consumers are willing to pay and, and seeing where that, that really equates. You know, here in Iowa, we've seen some growth in both pasture acres, overall acres for organic production. It's still about 1% of our total farm acres. So, it, you know, that gives you how, how small the market it is, but it is growing um, we're seeing increase in uh, cattle numbers, mostly in the feedlot sector, not necessarily beef cow numbers. Those have been pretty steady. And I think, you know, we're, we're maybe finding that that kind of sweet spot right now because, you know, organics a market. We don't we don't want to overproduce there. Right. That's going to bring down that premium and having an additional having a larger cost. Um, that's not going to be very um, conducive to producer profitability. When you speak of the premiums, though, and in the article you captured this, what level of premiums are we seeing being paid for organic beef vis-a-vis other beef in the trade? So I use the USDA's weekly retail organic price comparison report. And in 2019, uh, we've seen about a a $3.5 premium. Um, And that's a, a simple average over all products. You know, and so it's going to vary significantly. If we look at 2020 here, uh, the two products that that are promoted a lot are 80 to 89 percent lean ground beef. Uh, that has has had a premium here in 2020 of about a dollar to almost six dollar per pound. The next uh, most promoted product is is boneless New York strip steak, and those premiums range from about two dollars to fourteen dollars. Um, and so, you know, the, the premiums can be very significant, but also they, they can be minimal, too. And so, you know, sometimes those lower prices or the narrower spread needs to needs to be there to clear the market. Right. And I think importantly here in 2020 is that those premiums held up. Right. And that's another indication that that beef demand has held up in 2020. So when you take this information and look forward, it would appear that organic beef has a niche and will retain that niche for the foreseeable future. You know, I think given what we've seen so far and, you know, it, it hasn't been a flash in the pan, right? This has been a market that's continued to grow over time. Uh, there's a certified organic program uh, available through USDA. Um, you can be exempt if, if you don't sell to a certain level. But, you know, that, that it really has maintained and I think it has some name recognition. And 2020 has been a big shock, right? So that that's kind of one indication that, you know, that this market has held up. Now, you know, going forward, it ultimately demand is going to dictate how big this uh, market can be, right? And, uh, you know, we'll see that potentially ebb and flow over time. Well, then, speaking of going forward, this will be the last opportunity we have to visit in this calendar year 2020. And what is your thinking as far as 2021 and the general cattle market outlook, Lee? We're heading into this new year on pretty sound footing overall. What's ahead? 
Well, I think more of the same from a standpoint of, of stabilization, right? And, and a return to, to normal conditions. Now, I think expectations are that, you know, we are turning the corner and, and we're going to see tighter supplies in, in the form of, you know, placements as well as those slaughter levels. Now, it's not going to be dramatic, right? I think we're going to see kind of a, a, a slow decline in, in those slaughter levels and, and beef production. But overall, you know, that that is a, a tailwind to prices. And I think there's expectations. You don't have to look any further than futures prices and say, we're going to see higher prices in 2021 than in 2020. Now, the level of those could, could vary. You know, I'll give you a point of reference here if we look at the Livestock Market Information Center for fed cattle prices has a range of 114 to 119 in 2021. Futures prices would have it at 117. Uh, USDA, their estimate is about 114. So I think that that kind of shows you that you know there's a fairly wide range there, but that compares much higher than the 108 we've seen here in, in 2020. Calf feeder cattle prices also expected higher. There, I, I think we're expecting quite a bit uh, strength in those prices as we get into January and February. Um, you know, we've kind of seen quite a bit of pressure on those calf and, and especially yearling prices so far this year. And so, you know, I think if we continue to see maybe better than expected weather, that should really help support those those feeder cow prices. That's going to add to cow calf producer profitability this year, um, especially if we've seen them retain those, those calves. If all of that comes together, that's just more impetus for us to push 2020 behind us and get into 2021. You know, and, and, and I'll leave you with this, you know, no one's seen COVID coming, right? right? And so I think producers need to understand, you know, what their break-evens are and, you know, how sensitive those break-evens are to big swings potentially in, you know, their, their big component. Thanks, as always, and uh, in advance, happy holidays to you. Appreciate it. To you and our listeners as well. Lee Schultz, Livestock Economist, Iowa State University, with this week's cattle market segment. And you're listening to Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. Welcome back to Agriculture Today. And as we promised you on Friday's edition, we wanted to bring back up this topic of livestock feed biosecurity and the vast amounts of research that folks here at Kansas State University have been doing in this area of biosecurity. Joining us once more is Cassie Jones, feed scientist, animal sciences and industry department, and from the College of Veterinary Medicine at K-State and its Diagnostic Medicine and Pathobiology Division, George. Gordon Gebhardt. Both of them presented their latest research findings primarily on African swine fever, its threat and how it moves about in swine feed processing and distribution at that swine day. What we'd like to do, though, is talk about this whole concept of biosecurity and something, Jordan, that you brought up in your presentation at Swine Day, the idea of bio-exclusion. Define that. Sure. So so bio-exclusion is a, is a portion of biosecurity. And biosecurity, in a larger context, is understanding how certain infectious organisms can spread between populations of susceptible animals and what can we do to implement control measures and reduce the, the ability for this contamination to spread within those populations. So bio-exclusion is a component of that, and what that is, if we have a population of susceptible animals to a particular pathogen, bio-exclusion is everything we put in place and the procedures we put in place to avoid that pathogen, in this case a virus, from coming into contact with that susceptible population. So in the terms of feed biosecurity, if we have a feed mill and, and these feed trucks and manufacturing equipment, the trucks going from farm to farm, the concept of bio-exclusion is avoiding 
bringing pathogens into this mill to start with keeping the virus out of the feed mill to start because once we know that once it gets into a mill, in many cases it becomes widely distributed and we really don't have great methods to remove that contamination and remove that virus from these feed mills. We think it's a lot easier to keep it out in the first place and as opposed to being reactive and trying to respond to get it out or to remove it. So, and turn to you, Cassie, what do we know about this tactic that is excluding these pathogens, whether they be a virus, a bacteria, whatever the foreign agent is that we don't want in the feed processing mechanisms? What do we know about things that can be done now? Yeah, there are actually a number of hurdles that we've learned through both our controlled research at places like the Biosecurity Research Institute and our Feed Safety Research Center, as well as in production settings like Jordan's work in Vietnam, as well as some work that we've got going on right here in Kansas within some production systems. Those hurdles are things like knowing where your ingredients come from. In all cases, we have to bring in ingredients into a feed mill. And knowing where those ingredients were previously, where they originated, and any potential inherent risks that come with them, like the likelihood that they might contain one of these devastating viruses or bacteria, that's an important thing to consider. And one of the things we can do is, like Jordan said, bioexclude. We can have bioexclusion principles to just ensure that we don't allow some of those high-risk ingredients in the facility altogether. Another hurdle is that we can begin to extend biosecurity from our farms into our feed mill. And a lot of what we've learned from, again, our production settings, from Jordan's work in Vietnam, has demonstrated that these are principles that can be applied pretty practically into the feed manufacturing setting. And then the final one is really in case that there's a very um, specific risk. And unfortunately, we have had cases um, recently in the United States with endemic pathogens. And then also, as we're looking at foreign animal diseases coming in, where from time to time, we need to be more careful. And at that point, we can create another hurdle, which is by adding different feed additives or adding some thermal processing to the feed itself to really further eliminate any potential risk. And so it's really all of these hurdles that are necessary for full feed safety. So Jordan asked you to keep it down to the farm gate level here. What one or two principles do you see upon having studied all of these things that uh, the livestock producer, and we'll take it beyond swine here, but the livestock producer could be doing to advance this cause, if you will? Absolutely. I think there's, in some of the recent experiences from both some of our international work and really some recent discussions we've had here within the state of Kansas with some producers. One area that I, I think we really need to emphasize and continue to emphasize, not only in the swine industry, but animal agriculture in general and understanding feed manufacturing, feed processing, and feed delivery to our farms is communication. If we have a a swine facility, for example, or a feedlot operation or whatever it may be, if we have a certain disease outbreak, a certain health issue, we need to communicate that with the right people. And in general, there's a certain um, stigma associated with communicating some of those health challenges and, and wanting to internalize a lot of that information. But something like this, where it's connected as our feed supply chain is across a variety of different entities and different production systems, we really need to begin to communicate better across these different systems. If I'm a producer and I have a certain health event, I should communicate with a feed mill so that feed mill knows how to handle that feed truck. We've clearly demonstrated in the research that trucks and people can spread this virus back. So we need to communicate with the appropriate parties to make sure that we can implement those control measures, as Cassie mentioned, to reduce the chance of us spreading that virus back to the mill and then to other farms. So the big takeaway that I'd like to to emphasize is just the importance and the need for communication across different production systems and across different stakeholders within the feed supply chain. How about sanitation practices themselves and, well, frankly, the affordability of those for the average livestock operation out there. Is that a concern? It's one of those things that I think it's important to have the discussion and have the thought process before you get to the point where you need it right now. So, for example, my husband ranches in Wabunsee County, and foreign animal disease transmission through feed is not something that we talk about very often in the beef cattle industry, but there is some concern with foot and mouth disease, and um, a lot of these principles that we've been studying on swine-specific diseases at K-State can be applied to other animal agriculture industries. And so as we think about that, 
we do have plans through some of the KDA and USDA initiatives to help producers understand where should their feed delivery lines be? How could they go about sanitizing trucks coming in or out of the farm? And many times we're thinking about animal exclusion and control of animal vehicles. But it's also important for us to think about that in terms of feed as well. And to build on that, one of the areas that just by nature and somewhat unfortunate in nature is that biosecurity is complicated. In many forms, we have to add additional steps or additional hurdles in what we do. This complicates as a farmer. It complicates what we have to do. In addition, a lot of those things, sanitation, shoe covers when getting out of a vehicle at a site, decontaminating a facility, certainly has a cost in, a, in the value of time necessary to do that, as well as a, the physical cost for those supplies. So biosecurity certainly has an inherent cost to it. That's time, that's money, and that's part of the reason why we do it is to take those extra measures to reduce the risk and assuming that that reduction in risk has the value enough to, to offset those additional costs and, and additional hassle. But by nature, biosecurity is complicated, it adds extra steps, and it costs money. But we believe that in many scenarios that in certain situations, it's absolutely necessary. And the benefit of implementing those additional measures certainly outweighs those costs. And certainly with what we've seen in in an area with uh, a circulation of a highly impactful disease like ASF, Certainly, taking those extra steps and those extra measures absolutely has a cost benefit at the level of risk reduction for that disease introduction within their populations of animals. And as a related footnote might bring up here, you two are contributing to a series of extension publications for producers and others in the industry in as far as these biosecurity protocols. Yeah, as Jordan said, we know that this is complicated. And so our job is to help communicate what are really the most important things to different sectors of the industry. And so on our website, ksufeed.org, we have a number of our new extension publications that are really focused on feed safety for these different audiences. So whether they're for swine producers, for feed mills, or for swine veterinarians. And in this case, these are really targeted towards swine diseases, both endemic and prevention of foreign animal diseases through feed and ingredients. But, Eric, again, I want to emphasize that if we're taking steps to understand potential disease transmission in other routes through other other species like beef cattle or poultry that we might be raising on the farm, it's important for us to continue and evaluate the role of feed in that pathogen delivery as well. And so if you do have a, an animal disease outbreak or if you have a disease incidence on the farm, and you're already taking steps in terms of trailers or um, people coming in and off the farm to make sure that you don't have transmission to other other animals at other sites, let's make sure that that communication is also extended through the feed industry. Excellent. KSUfeed.org. Check that website out for good information. And great research inroads have been made in this whole arena. Congratulations to the two of you on what's been accomplished to date. And uh, Keep it going, because this means so much to our livestock sectors. Thanks for your time once more. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And joining us here from the Animal Sciences and Industry Department, feed scientist Cassie Jones from the College of Veterinary Medicine, a researcher in the Diagnostic Medicine and Pathobiology Division, Jordan Gebhardt. They talked about feed biosecurity once more at the recent K-State 2020 Swine Day, and we've been tapping them for some of their observations on this critical area for livestock production in our country. We'll be back with more after this break. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128 plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. You're listening to Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network. Once again, we're now in our 97th year of broadcast service to agriculture here in Kansas and the Central Plains. Eric Atkinson with you. Today's agricultural news headlines coming your way now, courtesy in part of DTN. 
The level of acreage enrolled in the Conservation Reserve Program as of October is at 20.7 million acres. That's down from 21.9 million acres as of September. And this is a smaller total than had been expected based on the combination of contract expirations and new enrollments under the most recent general CRP sign-up, as well as the continuous CRP efforts. Expectations had been that the combination of expirations and new enrollments would have put acreage at about 21.6 million acres. Based on data from the USDA, the difference appears to be that not all of the acres approved for enrollment under the general sign-up 54 and the CRP grassland sign-up were actually enrolled. The USDA said that 3.4 million acres had been approved for enrollment via the general sign-up, but through October, only 2.8 million had been enrolled. And of the 1.2 million acres that had been improved for enrollment in the CRP grasslands effort, only 920,000 acres had been enrolled through October. It's not clear if the smaller-than-expected acreage enrollments from the general sign-up and the grasslands effort reflect delayed reporting of contracts starting or whether growers actually opted not to follow through with their enrollment intentions. The USDA has released 2020 income estimates for the livestock sector. And here's a look at that now from the USDA's Gary Crawford. If you are in the livestock or animal product business, you may be painfully aware of the hit you've probably taken during 2020. And now the Agriculture Department is taking a shot at projecting just how much of a hit. It's out with its new farm income estimate for 2020. And USDA's chief economist, Rob Johansson, says... Even though we've seen a recovery in some prices recently, we know that COVID caused a significant decline in cash receipts received by the livestock sector in 2020. He says compared to 2019, animal and animal product cash receipts will decline by $9.7 billion or about 5.5%. And the pain has been spread throughout the sector, broilers, cattle, and hogs. However, Johansson says once 2020 is in the rear view mirror... We'll see uh, next year things moving in a continually positive direction for cash receipts. We'll have to see if higher cash receipts will be enough, though, to counter what looks to be a significantly higher cost for feed in 2021. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Back on Friday, the EPA announced a proposal to improve the safety of using the insecticide chlorpyrifos. The proposal follows a draft risk assessment that the agency released back in September. The EPA is proposing labeling amendments to limit applications associated with drinking water risks, as well as requiring additional personal protection equipment and application restrictions to address handler risks. The agency is also proposing spray drift mitigation in addition to use limitations and application restrictions to reduce exposure for off-target organisms. Now, Corteva announced back in February that it was phasing out production of chlorpyrifos, the company citing falling demand for the product in the U.S. as the primary reason for that decision. Chlorpyrifos, the main ingredient in what was Dow AgroSciences' Lorsban insecticide, Corteva, uh, of course, obtained Dow AgroSciences and is a spin off agricultural company from parent company Dow DuPont, formed when Dow and DuPont merged back in 2017. First registered in 1965, chlorpyrifos is an organophosphate insecticide, and it's used in a broad range of crops, corn, alfalfa, cotton, wheat, and soybeans, chlorpyrifos targeting a range of insects such as aphids, armyworms, cutworms, bean leaf beetle, rootworm, and spider mites. It's been available under several brand names, including Lorsban and Cobalt, between 2012 and 14, Dow estimated to EPA an average of 640,000 pounds were applied to an average of almost 800,000 corn acres per year. Now, the EPA vowed to continue its re-registration of chlorpyrifos, ensuring that generic formulations of the chemical will remain legal to use in the years to come. And the U.S. Department of Transportation's Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration has published an interim final rule that clarifies the definition of agricultural commodity in the hours of service regulations. Currently, drivers transporting agricultural commodities are exempt from those requirements within a 150-mile radius from the origin or the source of the commodity destination during harvesting and planting seasons. It's intended to ensure proper enforcement of 
above the hours of service exemption. The interim final rule is effective this Wednesday, December the 9th, and comments and petitions for reconsideration of it may be submitted by December the 24th. Well, on the agricultural calendar, a yearly conference that provides knowledge and support to women in agriculture has announced that its 2021 event will be held online. Women Managing the Farm will be held virtually February 10th through the 12th. The organizers say the format, like many other events brought about by the uncertainties of a pandemic, will continue to offer a setting for women to develop these skills, resources, and knowledge for success in the competitive agricultural industry. Nearly 300 attended the in-person conference this year. Women Managing the Farm has been held each year since 2005, attracting women farmers, rural business leaders, and landowners. K-State Research and Extension has been among the partners conducting this event. During the upcoming three-day virtual conference, conference speakers will be focusing on creating community online and at home by providing attendees with tools that cover these topics, agricultural and estate law, crop production, marketing, management, and relationships, and health. The organizers say a new aspect here in 2021 will be a resource library of videos and materials for maintaining a healthy and sustainable home and business life. Now, registration and more information is available online. We'll give you that address in a moment. The cost will be $50 per person. That website also includes information about the speakers, the programs, the exhibitors, and the scholarships. And the website is womenmanagingthefarm.com. That's womenmanagingthefarm.com. Gay State Research and Extension among the co-sponsors of the 2021 edition will be held February the 10th through the 12th virtually. This quick reminder before the break, if you haven't yet, check out our podcast service. It's as easy to as going to agtoday.net, and you can learn how to have the daily podcast automatically downloaded to your mobile device there, agtoday.net. And you're listening to Agriculture Today. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. This is Agriculture Today. I'm Jeff Wickman. As we continue to face the challenges of COVID-19, Kansas 4-H has launched a webinar series to support 4-H parents dealing with some of the new struggles facing their families. Kansas 4-H program leader and 4-H Youth Development Department head Wade Weber discusses some of the topics they'll address during the Parenting Through a Pandemic series. Wait, as we continue to deal with the pandemic, Kansas 4-H is stepping forward and they've started a series called Parenting Through the Pandemic. And this is really a way to connect with the parents of 4-H youth. Absolutely. We're excited to launch this series here during December and having an opportunity for five sessions where we're talking about topics related to remote learning. I'm going to be doing one regarding project-based learning and how that can partner in 4-H. And then also uh, we're Please have Dr. Elaine Johannes, December 7th, December 14th, as well as December 17th on topics related to family resilience, you know, how to move forward during the holiday season and how to have those important conversations that help build up your family unit and ultimately benefit young people in, in building that resilience, help them cope with the changes and challenges in front of them, but also put them in a position to be thriving as they go forward. Is this series live, or is this being archived and they can just watch it whenever, or both? Well, it is an um, opportunity for people to register to be a part of the conversation. And again, on the Kansas 4-H website, uh, there's a registration form that you can submit your contact information, and then you get an email link that allows you to be a part of the conversation. But all of the sessions will actually be archived and put underneath the family resources page on the Kansas 4-H page for folks to be able to take a look at that afterwards if they're not able to join us live during that session. Resilience is one of the major topics that you're going to be focusing on? Yeah. Dr. Johannes in particular is talking about how do we 
improve conversation around family resilience. In other words, you know, talk about how is everybody doing? You know, what are some things that are a challenge? What are the things that we're looking forward to? You know, during this time of year, there's oftentimes many rituals or routines or things that we look back upon our, you know, kind of rhythm of life and uh, time with family, et cetera. Um, That's, you know, pretty significant in helping us all mark time and, you know, establish those connections and reinforce those relationships as well. And so she's going to be leading in conversation uh, with interested 4-H parents and others who might be interested in really talking about how do we keep building up each other? Uh, How do we keep talking about things, hopefully when they're small and manageable? And how do we, you know, get through those tough patches and then really put ourselves in a position to, you know, jump into the next year and and really be purposeful in, in allowing the posture towards life, not just to be about things that happen to you, but rather um, really being purposeful in uh, really kind of shaping what the future looks like as we go into 2021. And I think that's I think that's one of the lessons we probably learned in 2020 is the opportunity for us to continue to define um, the values and to clarify the purposefulness that we'll have in relationships with each other as we've encountered lots of disruptions in 2020. But uh, it doesn't change the fact that we still have that basic need and intentionality about around community, around family, and around learning. And that really, that's one of the primary things that we want to highlight and encourage parents and, and uh, provide resources to parents to help them in that journey. 4-H has made a number of changes, a number of alterations to the way they deliver their programming. <laughs> what are you hearing from agents? What are you hearing from club leaders in terms of how well the 4-H youth are doing? Are, are they making their way through this? I think that's a great question. And to be honest, like many of us, it probably depends on the day. For many 4-H volunteers, 4-H club participants, as well as families. What I've heard and what I've seen is that, one, there's been a lot of positive regard in the whole aspect of let's do something together. And so purposing to, whether it's to move our delivery modes into online formats, you know, all the things that we talked about this last year, you know, everything from moving some of our camp experiences to a virtual context just to try and create that connection and ambiance and intentionality around it. Uh, We also had some um, camp in a box kind of experiences where kids signed up and then they sent activities to them. And sure enough, they did those on their own and then came back together in a Zoom format and shared with each other what they learned, you know, all the way to our fair experiences in person as well as virtual But then even into the fall and and moving some of our experiences with judging contests and others, there's really been a a way in which we've been asking the question, how can we keep making sure that the door is open, you know, that access is available to anybody who wants to participate? And at the same token, how can we continue to grow those relationships with people who have content knowledge, who have content expertise, who have something to share with others to encourage them in learning? And then at the same token, to build that uh, social network, you know, in the club, you know, within the county or the district, and, and ultimately um, being a part of the 4-H learning experience. Uh, again, that partnership with the local unit, uh, local community, and Kansas State University, trying to create it, that those attractive pathways for young people to learn those life skills and responsibility, resilience, and purposefulness. That's what, again, we've learned in this last year, even in the midst of disruption, it's important for us to clarify our values and to continue to choose into activities that help affirm those values and continue to build that resilience within our family unit as well as ultimately for young people as they continue to grow up, you know, and become those decision-making adults that are ultimately going to be contributors to our community and helping us tackle whatever's next into our future. It's really kind of amazing how 4-H was able to do so much during the pandemic when other things were being totally thrown away, discarded. 4-H still managed to keep the youth involved. They kept them connected. And as you say, they kept them moving forward and on a a path to finishing as many projects as they could. Absolutely. And I think this is what we're going to talk about in our series, you know, is that you can still have goals. You know, you can say, what are the things that we want to learn about? And then identifying what are the resources that can help me learn those things. We're learning that mentoring, the opportunity to find and talk to an expert about an interest area, 
you know, in some respects, uh, our virtual environment is throwing the doors open to gain access to some people that maybe relationally you didn't know down the street. But now all of a sudden you have the opportunity to build a relationship with even somebody halfway around the world. And that's a unique opportunity. And I'm really thankful that, you know, as a part of the extension system, the 4-H program allows access and a unique opportunity for young people to learn in some ways that are really, really unprecedented. And if it was only up to me and my family to try and figure out, you know, how to encourage my kids to think about the world a little bit broader than maybe what's out their front door. That's State 4-H program leader and 4-H Youth Development Department head Wade Weber. Again, for more information or to register for the Parenting Through a Pandemic series, visit kansas4h.org. And that'll do it for the Monday edition of Agriculture Today. Along with Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman. This is the K-State Radio Network.